talking today about English colonization and the exploration of the Americas, specifically Roanoke Island. This is something that often gets overlooked in the popular history of this period. It kind of gets lumped in with American history. And especially as the first permanent colony, Jamestown, wasn't settled until 1607, we tend to think of this as being separate from our Tudor period. But the fact is that the Elizabethans were very much interested in settling in and exploring the Americas, launching the equivalent of, I read it was called like the equivalent of their own Apollo program. And that's what we're going to talk about this week, specifically Roanoke. So anyway, I have done a few episodes on topics dealing with exploration in Tudor England. I did a show on the quest to find the Northeast Passage, with which led to trade with and a marriage proposal from Russia. I also did one on how trade fueled exploration, the economy of exploration. But this week, I'm going to focus specifically on America and the lost colony of Roanoke, which happened just about at the same time as the Spanish Armada battle 20 years before Jamestown. So there is no question that our Elizabethan friends would have been closely following the development of the Roanoke colony. That line from Shakespeare's The Tempest that I read can attest to the interest in colonizing. The Tempest is a really interesting play all about the politics of colonization. um, And it it really dives into racial issues, a, a lot of good stuff in there. And The Tempest came out right around the same time as Jamestown. So it was something that was really interesting and that people were really thinking about. And this was really big news. One of the most popular books at this time was also the the first travel guide by uh, Richard Hakalite. He's known for promoting the English colonization of North America through his works. He wrote Diverse Voyages Touching the Discovery of America in 1582, and then The Principal Navigations, Voyages, Traffics, and Discoveries of the English Nation. That was 1589 to 1600. He was publishing that So Roanoke and the Americas were on the minds of our Elizabethan friends. Now, as far back as Henry VII, England was dipping its toe in the exploration game with Henry hiring the Cabots to do some early explorations. John Cabot claimed Newfoundland for England in one of those very early journeys. But then things sort of died down until the Russian journeys. Henry VIII was busy founding a new church and getting married a lot. And, you know, who can have time for exploration when you've got weddings to plan? Then we had the Russian journeys under Edward. And then in 1577, England takes a huge step forward with Francis Drake circumnavigating the globe. And he completed that voyage in 1580. Drake had previously made a number of voyages to the Caribbean on trading missions And he had learned and recorded all of the notes on how to navigate through the area. So Drake sailed between the five continents of Europe, Africa, North and South America, and Asia. It took him 1,020 days. Five ships left in 1577 from Plymouth. And the Golden Hind was the largest at 120 tons. It was actually called the Pelican then. It changed its name midway through the voyage. And only the Golden Hind completed the voyage and returned to Plymouth. So now with that backdrop, let's jump forward to August of 1590. August of 1590, we've got Governor John White. He is the governor of the Roanoke Island settlement. He had to leave the small settlement three years before to get supplies. And after a delay because of the war with Spain and the Armada, he finally came back. He was really anxious to see his family and friends. Over a 100 men, women and children had been left behind. Governor White came on shore. He expected to be greeted by his family, but instead he saw fresh footprints and nothing else. White and his men proceeded to explore the island. They discovered a tree with the letters CRO carved into it. And then when they reached the place where the settlement had been, they saw a post which, quote, in fair capital letters was graven Croaton without any cross or sign of distress. This was part of the code that White had agreed upon in advance with the colonists. If they had to leave, they would carve the place where they were going to on a tree or a sign, and then they would add a cross if they had to go in an emergency. Neither of the clues that White found had crosses on them. Croaton at at that point had two names. It was both an island to the south, and it was also the name of the native people who lived on that island. Those people had allied closely with the Europeans. One of their leaders, Manteo, had actually become a good friend to the English. Manteo is a fascinating story worth some discussion. He actually befriended the English when they first arrived to explore in 1584. That first exploration was a reconnaissance mission. And the following year, 
a group of all men with White as the expedition artist, went against the Spanish claims to North America, and they arrived on Roanoke, hoping to find valuable pharmaceuticals and gold and a shortcut to the Pacific. In 1585, the English returned to Roanoke. They arrived too late in the year to plant crops and harvest food, and Manteo helped the colonists to make it through the harsh winter. He then traveled to England on two occasions, 1584 and 1585. After staying there, he was among those who sailed back for the New World in 1587 with Governor John White and the colonists who founded Roanoke. On August 13, 1587, Manteo was actually christened on Roanoke Island, making him the first Native American to be baptized into the Church of England. So back in that original 1584 trip to Roanoke, there were a lot of uncertainties and suspicions between the Native people and the Europeans, of course. And it says that the Europeans persuaded, quote, two of the savages being lusty men whose names were Juan Chese and Manteo to accompany them on the return voyage to London. They arrived at court in September 1584. Manteo and Juan soon caused a sensation. Walter Raleigh's priority, however, was not to get publicity for them, but he wanted to get intelligence and information about this new land of Virginia. And so he made it really difficult for people to get to the foreigners. He kind of really restricted access. He also assigned the scientist Thomas Harriet with the job of deciphering and learning the Algonquin language that they spoke and used a phonetic alphabet of his own invention in order to create a translation. So both Wanchese and Manteo stayed at Walter Raleigh's house in London, Durham House. Wanchese, though, did not seem interested in learning English, and he did not become friends with his hosts. He actually became very suspicious of the English motives, and he soon considered himself to be a captive of the English. But Manteo became friends with them, And by Christmas of 1584, the scientist Thomas Harriet learned to converse in the Algonquin language with the two Croatans. Harriet and Manteo spent lots of time with each other. And Harriet asked Manteo lots of questions about his life in the new world and learned a lot of what was going to be advantageous to the English settlers. He also recorded the sense of awe with which the Native Americans viewed European technology. He wrote, Many things they saw with us as mathematical instruments, sea compasses, and spring clocks that seemed to go of themselves, and many other things we had were so strange to them, and so far exceeded their capacities to comprehend the reason and means how they should be made and done, but they thought they were the works of gods than man. Manteo and Wanchese returned to the New World in April 1585. They sailed on Richard Grenville's expedition, the Tiger, that was led by Sir Ralph Lane, was accompanied by Harriet who had mastered the Algonquin language by this point and would be the translator between the local tribes and the English settlers. Manteo and Wanchese then sailed back to England. And then in 1587, they returned to Roanoke and were part of that original settlement. And Manteo is this example of an early friend to the English and a real kind of success story in terms of race relations. Although, of course, at the time, several of Manteo's friends and the people of the Croatan actually considered him to be disloyal and that he was a traitor. So Manteo was often caught in the middle there. So Thomas Harriet actually then wrote a brief and true report of the newfound land of Virginia. This was the first book about North America to be written and produced by an Englishman who had actually visited North America. It was first published in 1588 and then reprinted by Richard Hakalite and then Theodore de Bry. And Harriet's report documented his trip to Roanoke Island and also had the descriptions of the flora and fauna along with the Native Americans who lived there. And a brief and true report actually became one of the most important texts written about the early Americas. So in 1587, White led a third expedition. This was made up primarily of middle class Londoners. His pregnant daughter, Eleanor Dare, was among them. There were also 16 other women and nearly a dozen children. So this wasn't just men, this was families. And all told, more than 20 ships carried hundreds of people across the ocean into this unknown new world at this time. This was an investment of time and people that was larger than the later expeditions to Jamestown and Plymouth. And this is why it's called kind of the early Apollo expedition or the early Apollo program. White himself was a painter and he painted the natives that they met, paintings that are still in the British Museum. I'll put up images at englandcast.com so you can check it out. Those paintings were then turned into engravings in the later editions of the Harriet book. And together, these texts and the images, the woodcutting, played a really important role to encourage English investors to continue colonizing the New World. 
So in 1587, we've got the group of people arriving, and then White had to go home to get supplies, and then he got caught up in the war with the Spanish Armada and the, the war with Spain. So then jump forward to 1590, and he is back. He sees these signs that say Croatan, and he's not sure what happened. He's anxious to see his fr- family and friends, and he has no idea what's going on. He desperately tried to go to Croatan. It was an island that was only 50 miles to the south. But he also mentions that colonists originally intended to move 50 miles inland rather than to the south. So he wasn't sure which way to go. And he didn't have the provisions to stay longer and explore. And he needed to go home. When he returned to England, he found Sir Walter Raleigh, who was, of course, the colony's patron. And Raleigh was busy setting up a new colony in Ireland. And since White had no money of his own to fund his own voyage, he actually never returned to the New World. And the 115 colonists, including Eleanor and Virginia Dare, White's daughter and infant grandchild, were basically abandoned. Virginia Dare is remembered she was the first English baby born in the New World. So Virginia Dare and everybody else was just basically abandoned. White believed that the settlers had gone to Croatan, but searchers didn't find any evidence until after 1993, when a hurricane exposed large amounts of pottery and other remnants of a Native American village. So then they started doing some excavations. Back in the 1580s, there was a nearby inlet that made this an ideal place to gather oysters and scallops and catch fish. And there were actually patches of fertile soil that you could grow corn and beans on. And then after about a century, the inlet closed and it became part of Hatteras Island. So every year, a local organization, the Croatan Archaeological Society, sponsors an annual dig. And since 2013, the team has uncovered a variety of Elizabethan objects mixed in with Native American artifacts in the heart of this village that was exposed. They include the remains of what appear to be a gentleman's sword, it was a rapier, along with some scraps of European copper, the barrel of a gun, a lead shot, and a piece of drawing slate with its lead pencil. Some archaeologists actually believe that that slate would have belonged to White, could have belonged to White, and he used it for his sketches. And these finds are all one of the New World's few collections of Elizabethan artifacts at the very place where Governor White had believed that the lost colonists had gone. Case closed, right? except most of the objects that appear Elizabethan were actually found among other materials, such as tiny glass beads and broken pottery that date to more than half a century after White's failed rescue attempt. So archaeologists suggest that the older Elizabethan objects actually may have been kept by children or grandchildren of the abandoned settlers who assimilated into the Croatans. But even some members of the excavation team believe the material could have arrived through trade with later English settlements. But to confuse things even further, animal bones from trash heaps suggest that there was a really sudden dietary change where they fit, where they switched from fish and turtles to deer and birds. And that suggests that indigenous people were using European guns early in this contact period. Those are guns that maybe the lost colonists would have provided as they were assimilating into their culture. One interesting thing to note is that most of the English who were captured by Indians at this point or who deserted refused to return even if they were given the opportunity. The Native Americans would welcome women and children especially, and some warrior age men would be killed, others would be enslaved, but the vast majority were accepted as full members of the tribe. They would quickly teach them the language and the skills that they would need to live as part of the tribe. Many historians believe that the lost colonists followed this path and assimilated quickly into the Algonquin society. Over a hundred years later, in 1701, there was an explorer called John Lawson, and he visited the area and he heard that the Hatteras Indians claimed that, quote, several of their ancestors were white people, the truth of which is confirmed by gray eyes being found frequently amongst these Indians and no others. And he then believed that the lost colonists conformed themselves to the manner of their Indian relations. Walter Raleigh continued to hope that his colony survived, even if it was only to keep the charter that gave him the sole access to North America. But then it was South America that captured his attention next. His employees had heard Spanish stories of El Dorado, and he received Elizabeth's permission to sail to America again. In 1595, he left to search for the city of gold. 
And that expedition resulted in nothing but sickness and useless ore. And within a few years, England and the joint stock companies that were enabling investors to participate in this exploration focused their attention back on Virginia, leading, of course, then to Jamestown in 1607. 